designing Anne's Art Desk. These videos are brought to you by the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation. Hello everyone, this is Fanny Rutzik, Palo Alto Art Center Adult Studio Program Director, welcoming you to Lynn's um, last spring drawing class for this session. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a really great time. I've enjoyed all of the classes. Um, just so you know, we will be continuing um, offering online classes with Anne starting in June uh, with a four-week session. Uh, we will be transitioning to a fee-based class, as um, we mentioned last week, so I hope that um, you will all consider joining. I will have her first class on our online catalog, hopefully by the end of today and you will all receive an email link to that class. Um, thank you to the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation for making these first series of classes um, available for free um, during our shelter in place. And like I said, I hope that some of you at least will join Anne for her June and July drawing classes. Uh, without further ado, I turn it over to Anne. All right. I'll post the Google Classroom information again to everybody later. Um, but the Google Classroom code is Alpha Quebec 4, Mike, Bravo, Radio, Sierra. Um, today you'll need colored pencils, watercolor, maybe something to draw, or you can just do a draw along or imagination drawing, pen and pencil and, a, and an eraser and a sharpener. Paper towels and water. I was looking through my art library Welcome back, everybody. So nice to see you. And I found some fun books. I'll post these to you. I think this one has already been posted. Keys to Drawing with Imagination by Bert Dodson. Bert Dodson's books, Keys to Drawing, is, is probably my hero book for drawing. Um, it's, it's the textbook, essentially, I use to teach people to draw. If I'm designing lessons and things, they come from there. And his Keys to Drawing book with Imagination is also wonderful. So if you want to Work on your illustration keys, illustration skills, be an illustrator, be an editorial illustrator, play with children's illustration. It's a wonderful book. This is Animals Real and Imagined. And the idea here is that the author is this wonderful, or the illustrator is this wonderful um, person who can combine her imagination with observations of um, it, that she does in zoos and things, and she combines these animals to make new things. Um, so I love her work very much. Uh, wonderful stuff. I think in June we might talk a little bit about it some more because we'll be doing a little bit of how to combine sources and she kind of takes that to a whole new level. Um, organization levels have risen over the past week so I have a big stack of drawing paper right here ready to go. Atmospheric, to, atmospheric perspective is today's lesson and atmospheric perspective is a little bit different from linear perspective. Um, and that it's not really talking about all this stuff we did last week, like vanishing points, railroad tracks, spacing, measuring. Oh, if that tree were in the foreground, it would be like 500 feet tall, um, that kind of thing. What it's talking about is how this tree and this tree would appear different in terms of color, shadow, value, brightness. Um, whether we'd even have a shadow back here, um, how its lines would differ, that kind of thing. So what we're working on today is how those color changes occur and how you relay that in your painting and in your nature drawing. I find it particularly important for nature drawing because you always want to have your organisms live in an environment. And something that I really see a lot in nature drawing is that people kind of forget that every organism lives in an ecosystem. So atmospheric perspective is really important in knowing how to depict that ecosystem without having it sort of essentially uh, interfere or upstage your drawing or appear as if it were an afterthought or something you didn't really know how to do. So atmospheric perspective can really, having a knowledge of this stuff can really help you look very competent in your drawing pretty quickly. So atmospheric perspective, I'm gonna talk for a minute and then we're gonna do or we could do and talk, but I actually think having a little bit of a scaffold is important here. So things that are close by you tend to be bright. Um, things that are far away tend to be kind of um, less contrasty, I guess we'll call that. 
it's hard for me to think of these things while I'm talking, so I, um, I gave myself a little prompt. Um, things that are close by tend to be less gray, so more intense. I'll bring this chart back as we keep talking about this. And things that are far away tend to be fuzzy, so the opposite of that would be sharper. And then there's another one too, not just bright, but also things that are far away tend to be bluer. And things that are close tend to be warmer or redder. Or uh, probably more red would be, yeah, uh, cooler. So those are some general rules. Um, as you get into this, you'll realize that the general rules almost never apply, but these are fairly useful general rules. Um, I'm trying to write a few notes on here because when I post my uh, PowerPoint lecture after each one, having a few more notes helps me remember what I was doing. Um, so that's kind of a nice little summary of the things that happen in atmospheric perspective. Does anyone have any that I missed? Um, other things that happen as things get farther away in terms of color. Um, so there's atmospheric perspective that has, has to do with line. You can depict atmospheric with line perspective with line and you can depict it with color. And we did a little bit of this in our very first week. Um, and we can revisit that a little bit if you want. All righty, so that's some general rules. I'm gonna keep bringing that paper back into view as we get going. So one way I like to talk about this is, um, still life painters are like, but hey, I'm painting something that's six inches deep. It's still important. So still life people, need it. Sorry, a very weird sound just happened in my front yard. Um, still have people need it. Landscape people need it. Nature drafts people need it. City drawers need it. Okay, we can just go through the whole list of art. If you're an artist, you probably need it. Um, it's also important in um, abstract painting because abstract painting relies so heavily on design. And um, here, I'll stop wiggling this thing because that's probably hard to look at. Abstract painting relies heavily on design and the sense of warm and cool and distance and near and far is also important in abstract painting. So, um, it's not like you can ever decide you don't want to do it. Um, so it can be important just like in this short distance of about five or six inches in looking at these uh, roses. Um, and it's also important looking like half a mile out on the skyline or whatever. And the way I guess I'm going to start showing this is by doing two little drawings. One of them will just be a black and white drawing and then one will be in color. Just so that you can see there's a linear component to this and there's a color component to this. So I'm gonna do the black and white drawing first. Um, yeah, detail is a good thing. I think that I, I, to me, sharp here, but I think detailed is an excellent way to put that. Um, okay. To me, sharp and fuzzy encompasses detail, but maybe that's paint speak inside my head. Um, here we go. So two little drawings slash paintings. You'll quickly discover that if you love atmospheric perspective and you love painting, you will transmogrify from a line drafts person to a shape person. And you'll see these drawings come into shape. Sorry, there's a lot of punning going on here. Um, in, in those two different terms. So I'm just gonna make up a little landscape that's fairly common around here. Um, some hills in the distance, because those are cute. Maybe there's some, today's big clouds. There you go. Um, and often on our hills around here, there are these uh, big trees. And the one here, maybe it has a light side. So I just decided that the light's coming from over here. I'm going to keep it constant in my picture, um, like coming from over there. I don't like kisses, so I got to not have it cross that line precisely. And I'm just going to have a little line drawing. It's actually a mass drawing because I'm shading it. You can see the shape of the hill because this shadow doesn't go like that, right? That would indicate a flat form. Um, and then there, say there's another nice tree over here. That one needs a different treatment. 
a lighter, softer, gentler treatment. And that just that line treatment tells you a lot about how this one is close by and that one is over there. Very soft little line treatment. You can do the same thing by making this near hill have a stronger line than this far hill. And even if you have an intermediate line here and you make this line even stronger, you'll quickly see that the lines themselves, um, referring back to our little chart, little did you know when you signed up for my class that it could all get so charty and mathy. Uh, let's see, sharp and detailed, brighter and more intense. We need to add another line that we're gonna call bold and soft. I knew there were more that would come up as we started yakking. So there you have it. Already it looks more deep, right? Um, this one could even make a difference between the farthest hill, like that. Uh, if the light's coming from there, maybe there's a little bit of a fall away shadow here. Uh, likewise, there could be a fall away shadow here that's even lighter. Um, if we think this cloud is in front of that cloud, then this cloud can be a little heavier. So all these little um, changes create the depth inside the painting. Um, so that's linear atmospheric perspective. But I'm using line weights, can't spell and talk and draw at the same time. Wow, that was bad. Um, can't even grok how bad that was. Okay. <laughs> linear atmospheric perspective using line weights. Sorry about that. All right. Now, if we go, if we bounce over here into uh, using color, but keeping in mind all this stuff, this is sort of, we're jumping right in. I wanna just show you this stuff a little bit. Um, we can start mixing around the color wheel a little bit, and I'll also demonstrate it in a short amount of space with these pretty roses, or maybe these awesomely gorgeous cherries a friend of mine brought. These cherries are literally a hug from a friend. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's bounce into some color. So I'm going to sketch it in a, in a mid-tone. So if you look at this color as if it were gray, it's about a middle gray. So if I had a little gray scale here, so think of it as um, a middle gray. Um, so I'm going to sketch it in a middle gray. And I'm going to sketch it a little bit more lightly so I do a little bit better job little tree over there, little shadow on that tree. So what I'm imagining here is that these trees are the same kind of trees. Say they're eucalyptus, kind of shaped like eucalyptus. They're not shaped like oak trees. So I'm not going to say they're an oak tree. Light's still coming from over here. Still clouds up in the sky. Another cloud over here. This is going to be a better painting because I'm drawing slowly because I'm starting to relax. Um, and again, I don't want this kiss to happen. We're gonna talk about composition in June, I think. Um, so I'll talk about what, what that means. Um, essentially, you don't want here. So if there's a tree here, you don't want the mountain to stop right here. You don't want this to happen. You want this scenario or you want this scenario where they either overlap or they don't. All right. <laughs> Near bright, sharp, warm red, detail gray, fuzzy blue. Cool, cool. Yeah. Here we go. Here are all the notes again. I wonder if I can have both on camera at once. How's that? I tend to start drawing off the picture pretty quickly. There we go. Cool, now we can have it all together. Um, so now if I draw this picture, what's gonna be back here, this whole part of the painting, back to the notes again, we want to have be cool. So we're gonna have a gradient right here, warm to cool. 
but as as we get into the foreground of the sky maybe right in here there'll be some warmth in the clouds that are closer does that make sense and you can essentially think this column here in the foreground maybe we'll just do this look at this we're going to call this a and this b and essentially what you need to do is go a to b actually maybe it's more like this in any classic landscape because the furthest away stuff is here on the horizon and then the sky actually curves up over you again. Okay, to the drawing, because I realize I've do, done a lot of fiddling inside the square that you probably can't see very well. Um, so seeing as I'd like to just sort of stay on track with my instructions, let me just pull out a few colored pencils that I've used with you before. So the same six for the colored pencil exercises that we've done. Um, so I was using a a warm yellow and a cool yellow, a bright red and a dark red, and a light blue and a dark blue. So let's just stick with our plans and hope that that blue has not gone walking someplace. I um, guess that's gonna be our light blue, even though I wish I had a different one, but I don't know where it is. Um, any questions so far? Here's a light blue, okay, here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I have two of each. That one goes over there. I'm gonna paint this little painting using these rules as quickly as I possibly can. So in the foreground, um, we're gonna have lots of warm colors. Don't worry, things will get mixed. And when you're shape painting, See how it doesn't matter whether it's light or dark or shadow or whatever? I'm just shape painting. It doesn't matter to me whether I'm painting the shadow or the light. I just want it all to work out in the end. Um, I probably want it to be a little bit more green, especially on the light sides. So see when I add a coating of yellow, the whole thing splashes over into green. So also notice that I used all my darkish colors over here. I th also think it should look a little bit more tree-like, so I'm going to make it more branchy, more eucalyptus-y. Light side. So nice warm colors, warm darks. Warm hillside. This is where we live. Uh, so I'm sort of imagining we're a month or two ahead rolling over into the fall season. We're still kind of green right now, it's lovely. But I'm thinking sunny hillside. So there's my foreground, look how hot it is. I may be exaggerating for a bit. Um, right, but this tree and this tree, they're both eucalyptus, they're both the same stuff. They literally have the same chemistry, made out of the same things. And this hillside, and this shadowed hillside, also made out of the same stuff. So I want this color here in the sunny hillside over here, and here in the sunny hillside over here, I want them to have an awful lot to do with them, with each other. So near hillside and far hillside are made out of the same thing. So maybe the shadow over here is bluer. So bluer, warmer. Right now I'm kind of working with this and this. Uh, whoops. <laughs> this is something I started doing when I was very small. <laughs> and then this, this tree will also be have a shadow side, but notice that I'm keeping the um, value very high. Uh, that's so I don't overblow it. I feel like I overblew it a little bit over here. And then I need a light yellow here. But then it doesn't differentiate between this and this very well. Let's see. 
So these aren't differentiating very well, but that's actually something that is very true of atmospheric perspective. So um, differences become less. So here we say um, high contrast, low contrast. So we just added another thing to our little chart there. Um, let's see, we can probably make it more different by adding a little bit more dark here and just making it stand out. I'm also showing that hill's slope by showing where the shadow goes. So this hill, this shadow smooths down that face and the shadow smooths up that face. So let's see, we have another one to go. So this one will also be pretty light. But maybe we're gonna shift over into like, you know how as you go up in the mountains, you get hills that are covered in conifers. You get these kind of purple hills in the background. They're very cool. They're, see how I can use true blue and that seems to be fine. Um, the ones that are closer, I can layer over with a purple. And see how warming them brings them closer. Yeah, this is all working out just fine. Warmer, bluer. Leaving some of them just plain blue tells the story that some of them are farther away. Any questions about this stuff? And because I'm a painter, I can't help this because, you know. Um, one of the, I've been thinking a lot, a lot lately about what are the meta drawing skills? Um, and this idea that you sort of work the whole canvas at once and that colors jump around and are useful everywhere is one of these sort of meta drawing skills. Um, so now we have, I've kind of painted myself into a little bit of a corner because I've used what I would ordinarily use as a light sky blue as this far mountain blue. Um, so I'm wondering if I can use this as the tree hill blue instead, thus preserving my light blue for, um, for the sky. This is something that happens when you paint with only six colors that don't mix very well. You have to sort of get a little tiny bit creative. I'm okay with that though. This is also something that you learn from pastel painting, where you may not have the exact right color you need, so you just use what you have. And you'll notice that if you wanted to bring this cloud a little bit forward, if you warm it just a smidge with the yellow, it jumps forward. Also back to where were we? Warmer, redder versus bluer, cooler. All right. So there you go, a little tiny linear depiction of space, atmospheric perspective space, and color depiction of atmospheric perspective space. Any questions about that? I really wish my desk cam would zoom, but I can't get it to do that. I'm working on a new technology, but it was not up and running today. Um, you're welcome to raise your hand or to um, type into the chat window. Um, all right. Let's see. If, let me take one last look at this and see if there's anything else I want to do to it. Oh, there's a few things you can do to just bet everything. I think it's a kind of a neat thing. Um, one of my favorite painting teachers was this guy who lived in Pasadena and he got his start doing silkscreen paintings of surfers. But he really wanted to be a, a painter's painter and he, he just developed his skills until he became one. Um, and I took one workshop with him and he said, you know, Anne, you never have to angst about painting again. Painting isn't something you have to angst about. You just have to paint. That's all it is. And he literally changed my life with that little statement. I was always very, very grateful to him. Like, don't angst, just paint. Stop angsting. You know, if you ask the dude for the advice, you get the dude's advice. I thought it was really awesome. All right. 
So that's kind of, um, a I use landscape sort of as a jumping in place for atmospheric perspective because it's so easy for people to grok, you know, over half a mile, over a mile space, this is what happens to color and, and shape. You know, even as a linear sketch or as a color sketch, here are the rules that apply. It also works um, when you're doing um, still life or portrait work as well. Let's see if we can just keep that thing up in view. Um, I don't know if it's easier or more difficult to do this on a digital platform or a analog platform like I'm trying to do, but I kind of like just being able to move the pieces of paper around. Um, so I think I love this one because it has so many beautiful flowers, but I think just for the interest of kind of getting on with our lives, um, I may use this one or this one because just because we're going to get bogged down in, in that many flowers. Um, I also have this one. And I want something where you'll get to see the distance where I can set it up so that you get to look at it through the desk cam and I get to draw it as you see it. Um, and I actually, I kind of like the idea of doing a sort of quick linear study, but these are too small. Um, here, let's do it larger. Um, because the small one. Is that better? Um, and then I'm just going to draw straight ahead in my pencils, sticking to my six, um, so that it's all good. One, two, three, four, five, six. I still have them. Um, so I'm going to do a pencil, a pen sketch with this, so that you guys can see that happening. Um, just so that we once again have the linear and the shape thing. And then shape drawing. With the understanding that shape drawing, i.e., is painting. All right. Any comments? I love the red shadow and the blue shadow. Yeah, you know, the more you look at Monet, the more this becomes Monet. This is Impressionism in a nutshell. So it's a great comment because this is exactly what that all that stuff is about. So, all righty. Um, so what I wanted to show you with this is that one thing you can show in your illustrations. Um, this is particularly true of still life paintings or nature illustrations. Is that this flower is in front of that flower, or this leaf is in front of that leaf? And we did this week one. Um, but as your skills improve, it's always nice to revisit things that you might consider basic because your understanding of them and the improvements you can make will leap forward again um, to the same, in the same, inside the same topic. Um, I'm just looking for a fairly useful item here. Um, there is very soon going to be a giant order from Dick Blick because my art supplies are literally wearing out as I watch. Um, let me just draw straight up with, a, with this, be fine. All right, um, <laughs> I have a better idea. Um, one of the artists I follow on Instagram, Lucy Nisley, yeah, she draws colored pencils, but all she does is she draws the thing that is pink in a pink pencil and the thing that is green in a green pencil. So this will look pretty cute when we're done. Um, so here's the linear version in colored pencil. You can draw along, you can draw your own thing as I jabber away here. Um, but what I'm going to do is essentially use all that line language back again uh, to, to just show you how you show atmospheric perspective, but in um, in line. You can see, you can hear my voice stutter to a stop as I begin to draw.
I don't know. You should. You guys might be interested in trying this, but trying to talk and draw at the same time is quite the challenge. Um, I'm not being good about leaving all the little white spaces that ought to be there. I'm also trying to make this front rows. I'm drawing this one right now. Not very well, but still. Um, be kind of dark and heavy, because the magic here is when you go to draw the back rows, you draw it a little bit more lightly with a lighter hand. And you'll, you'll be astonished at how different the two of them look, even though they're literally half a centimeter apart. So this one looks farther away than this one, simply because we followed the detailed, sharp, less focused, fuzzy rules. Um, we can continue that. And just for the purposes of this lesson, and because I don't want to color mix on screen while trying to line draw at the same time, I'm going to do that with um, green pencils. I'll color mix when I get over here. It's more fun that way anyway. And it has a, a kind of a nicer result. So I'm, I'm being good about leaving my white spaces. Over here, I'll probably go back in and, and uh, make these lines thicker and darker. And now I'm sort of buzzing my data because this leaf is a much farther down, but I want to include it. So I'm just putting it in anyway. Okay, so now I'm going to skip over and put in a few dark greens just to give it a little bit more shape. So now I literally am trying to delineate shadow and shape, but with line. And I'm trying to show that this one is closer using detailed, fuzzy, sharp, intense, bright, um, redder, warmer, that kind of differentiation. And then over here where this leaf sort of reaches back into space, that's where I fuzzy it out again. Okay. Um, can likewise do that with up here where this leaf is a little bit in front of the others. So I can make even this flower have a little bit of shape inside of it. Um, if you really want to push your luck, you can also just do something like this where you shade in the near flower just a little bit to give it a little extra. Mm, likewise with something like this. So see how just a little bit brings it a little bit forward. You can keep playing with that kind of thing. Um, and and switching over from linear to shape, um, I would encourage you to do it with intention. It's very, very tempting. Um, and it's something that happens very, very quickly. So here we're gonna go into shape painting and try the same effect, but without the line, more with shape. Um, so let's see. When I'm shape drawing, I'm sort of free, right? I free, I'm free from the lines. Oh, I said I wouldn't do that. Let me take my greens out. Sorry for the terrible noise. Um, something watercolor artists do, and I think um, colored pencil artists do as well, this is sort of a useful tip, um, is they, uh, wash the things that are going to be green in yellow. So watch the magic happen. And then I'm washing my light greens in a light blue. And then I'll, I'll revisit it again with um, a darker blue for the things I want to be dark. And you don't have to do it in that specific order. I think people choose to do it starting with the yellow because it's often the lightest values and then they got they have a little bit more um leeway if they make a mistake
So then if I if I wash this far flower in a little bit of blue, I already do a, a lot for pushing it back. And I wash the near flower in a little bit of red, I do a lot for pulling it forward. So something that atmospheric perspective is very good at, you could, but guys can probably barely see this. <laughs> Let's see if it's working. Just want to check that everything's running right here. You guys can barely see this, so let me bring it up to to intensity. Um, here we go. Intensity levels rising. So something that's nice to do if you're watercolor painting or colored pencil painting. Um, notice I say painting because as soon as you step into shape, you are painting doesn't matter what you're working in. Um, I'm just bringing it all up to sort of higher intensity. In part because I want you to be able to see it, even though you're on the other side of the interwebs. Um, the centers are a little yellower. And then the background is bluer and softer, but not that much softer including there's some of that pretty bright red in there. And then the blue comes in and as soon as you put it on yellow, it, it sort of flashes into bright green. And this little sort of leftover um, anther stamen complex is actually kind of brown. Any questions? It's pixelating. Oh dear. That was that was the tech issue I was trying to fix today. And when I say tech issue, I mean lots and lots of downloading of plugins and trying to learn programming. Okay, thank you. Nice to have some feedback on that one. Um, so continuing onward. So here's the blue without any yellow. So I'm gonna have to go in and put in a little yellow. I like how roses are serrated, so I put that in. So if you wanna bounce this into, say you want this to become an illustration, right now it's a color sketch, it's a color study. So a linear perspective color study and a, um, a shape painting color study. Um, you can certainly sharpen it up with pen and ink. So you could take a pen and um, add a pen layer to it. It just sort of adds the precision in. Um, you could also, they're watercolor pencils, um, but you probably already knew that. <laughs> I also have these watercolor markers which are kind of fun because they act as watercolor and markers. Um, but I'm trying to stay within the bounds that I gave myself for this class. Um, so you can also just treat them as watercolor. And sort of something I often do is just solvate the bits that I really love. Um, or, or, um, melt the bits that I think should be dark is a very useful way to do this. And kind of bring it up into the, um, kind of the precision level you think is appropriate. Because right now it is very fuzzy for me at least, and not very scientific illustrative. You could probably get away with a greeting card at this point. Not to this greeting card. Here is the magic of water soluble pencils. Um, any questions about those two? I do think that this back one has gotten too bright, and I can just 
melt it back into submission with some glue, even some of this glue. The other thing you can do with watercolors, I'm going to put this down because I need my other hand, um, is if they're wet and you've made a mistake where something like this has happened and it's just too bright. I think that happened when I um, melted the, the watercolor. You can actually blob it back up. You want to be careful to blob once because otherwise you become a printmaker. For instance, I just printed, well, it's not printing, but you can become a printmaker and just mark up your whole painting, which is not also not the idea. Um, so that's kind of two ways to do this. Um, if you wanted to say imply that there are more roses in this ecosystem, say you wanted to build the ecosystem around this picture, um, you can certainly do that. Um, like you could put a very faint rose back here. And another one here. And there could be a little bud right here. Maybe another one right here. And then just for speed's sake, you can um, likewise just kind of populate a, a rose bush. Because this is really how roses grow. If you wanted to show this rose growing in its natural habitat, you would probably have to do something like this. Now it's sort of looking like a piece of artwork. I was getting discouraged there for a minute. Um, and if you wanted to start telling a little um, a little story about what's going on here, it would definitely need a little B. Although, you know, one reason I'm not very keen on on um, roses is that I often don't, I don't see very animals using, many animals using my rose. So I'm always like, eh, they're beautiful, but what do they do? Okay. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about? Any questions about that so far? Yes, you will need a Google account to open your classroom. Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't need to work on that anymore because when I look at it on the screen, you really can't tell what it's a picture of. Do a piece of paper. So something I wanted to show you is that one problem you have with atmospheric perspective, let's, let's take these leaves for instance, and this leaf. Do you see the problem? They're both the same distance away. But one fulfills column B, and one fulfills column A. Um, so you're like, ah. Uh, Life just got harder, and it did. This is um, a problem of something we call local color. So this one is grayer and cooler, um, lower contrast. This one is higher contrast. It's shinier, it's reflective, it's warmer. It literally has bits of red on it. So something you have to look out for when you are atmospheric perspective painting is this problem. Um, you know, a gray oak, like a blue oak that grows up on the hill, even if it's closer to you, it may have a cooler color than a eucalyptus that's farther away because it is literally redder by its very nature. So these two may have very kind of interesting flips in this chart. So when I say, here's the chart, here are the rules, this is true until you encounter this scenario or this scenario where things actually, because of the stuff they're made out of, they have a local color that, that seems to be inverting this, but instead you just have to learn how to deal with that and how to deal with the local color inversions. Um, 
you know, something you can do with the class code is literally put it into the Google search bar and it will bounce you into my Google Classroom and say, is this what you meant? Did you mean to sign into this Google Classroom? Um, it's rather clever, really. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of other ways I can explain, um, explain atmospheric perspective to you um, and things like how to deal with this in the outside bigger world. Um, something I often do when I'm sketching or drawing um, that's very useful, I love doing this, is I'll draw with different widths of pen. Um, this is particularly useful when you're sort of in the linear world. Um, so let's see, I have this pen and this pen, and one of them makes this mark, right? This mark, so small. One of them makes this mark, medium. And one of them makes this mark, wide. Um, and one of them makes this mark. Oh, I left the cap off. Huge. I'm not using that pen because I killed it, sadly. Um, so what, the, what that means is, out in the big wide world or on your desk or wherever you're drawing. Um, this is actually kind of a neat exercise. Say I'm gonna draw something imagination based now. Here's, here's a little conceptual based learning for you. Uh, say we wanted to draw an apple. And we, it's gonna be close in, so we'll draw it in our big bold, this one. Um, maybe it has a leaf. And it has a few details, right? Because it's close by. Say the leaf is shiny. It's got a little shiny highlight. And the apple is shiny. Um, and you can see this little bottom bit sitting there. Um, and then right behind it, there's another apple. But it doesn't have as many details. And maybe we just, maybe for the stem, it's a little bit further away. And maybe we only see the midline. Maybe we see a little bit of this, right? So one, two, you can already tell. So you're making two assumptions here, right? You're making an assumption that these apples, they're the same size. So this is something my son did that was really, really clever when he was like, he was, he was very vocal at a young age. And he was like, he was looking at an airplane and we were at the airport and he was like, as the airplane flies away, do the people and the airplane and everything inside it become smaller and smaller and smaller. So you're not telling yourself, oh, that apple shrank. You're telling yourself the apple is farther away and hence appears smaller. Um, I love the things little kids come up with. It's marvelous. Um, and just for, you know, you can actually check that. That's actually a linear perspective thing, right? Um, you could make another apple here. Let's use our small pen. Like that. And it would be in linear perspective. Um, so there's that. And they're also overlapping. So we're, 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 Referring back to that line language stuff we talked about earlier. And if you really wanted to, you could emphasize this by showing that this one is closer. So you have this like different ways to show depth. You're using linear perspective. You're using a little atmospheric line perspective. Um, you're overlapping them, which tells the viewer, hey, this one's over there. Um, so there's sort of an imagination thing going on here, but you can also layer that over with something like this. So when I'm drawing, this is another sort of meta drawing skill. I think of my different approaches as essentially Photoshop layers, or if you're not a Photoshop-y sort of a person or a, a computer-y sort of person, think of like an old overhead that had transparencies. Um, this is how I learned um, geometry when I was a kid. My math teacher had transparencies and he would just, 
have them all prepped and then the, the problem we were working on would just continue from one to another. Like that one should be cooler, right? So you see, as I'm going back, I'm putting less and less detail in. And then I'm developing the one in the foreground essentially more. And I'm also taking the opportunity to mix around the color wheel. So instead of adding green here, I'm adding blue, which keeps my colors sort of rich. So I'm, I'm essentially adding purple. If I wanted this to appear sort of sparklier and more like an impressionist painting, I would add yellow, not pink. Um, this one might behoove itself by having a little bit more yellow. And this one a little bit more orange. But this one would just get a very smallest touch of. You can do the same thing with the shadow. It's, uh, oh, I think that the, um, what, what am I missing? Uh, this needs some development too. You know, this one might just need a little bit of that, and that needs none. So see how you kind of wake, work your way through. Um, so essentially, we've layered linear perspective, and then we've plunked atmospheric perspective using the warmer sharper, more detailed, high contrast, intense, brighter. And then back here we have less contrasty, more gray, low contrast, fuzzy, and bluer, and in line with each other. Um, what else have we got? Any questions from that? <laughs> yeah, atmospheric perspective is on steroids. <laughs> You're right. Roses do have a beautiful use. I have come around to them, actually. Um, when I first moved here, I had a lot in my garden. I was like, yeah, I don't know about all the roses. It seemed to take a lot. But I, in neglecting them, I developed a respect for them. And the, it turns out they take almost nothing. And I was like, all right, fine, you can stay. Um, and then I started to really just enjoy how beautiful they are. Um, the same is true for the shadows that the roses cast, or that the, sorry, the apples cast. Um, uh, I think their their shadows should be a richer, more beautiful color. Something I always tell my painting students is that the color of the the sh object cast has nothing to do with the color of the object, nothing to do with the local color of the object, and everything to do with the color of the light. The screen keeps getting in my way. I'm taking it out. Um, I can't help it, sorry. Gotta paint, gotta paint, gotta paint. Okay, I don't know what comes over me. Um, so if the light is yellowish, the shadows will be purplish. If the light is reddish, the shadows will be green, that kind of thing. Um, and the color of the shadow also has to do with the surface it's sitting on. Um, so if, it's a, if the surface is a light blue, the shadow will be a dark blue, that kind of thing. So, it, it, so it's a combination of the local color of the surface and the color of the light. But that is a, something for a whole different time. I just wondered if anybody had a question like, why is she painting them red? Is that because the apples are red? That is not true. It's because I just imagined a weird color. Um, so if I painted the shadows this color and the light is sort of yellowish, I'm guessing that the surface has to be something like this. Just following my own color logic that I have completely made up here on the fly. But this is sort of, now we're, now we're essentially doing a beginning painting class. Um, <laughs> if I change the color of the shadows, I'd also have to change the color of the table in the light. They're paired. Um, so there you have it. Any other questions about all of that stuff? Um, sorry, leaning into my camera is not very polite. Um, 
What about the shadows? Is there atmospheric perspective for the shadows? Yes, there are. And if it's not showing up, I probably haven't done it right. Uh, let's make this one a little bit darker and sharper. Something that's interesting about shadows is that where they're first cast, that's where they are sharpest. And then as they get farther away from the object that's casting them, they scatter the light. The light scatters around them and they become fuzzier. I may just be running into the limits of my medium and my paper. This paper is full. It won't take any more. This one should probably be a little lighter, but I can't fix it now because I don't really have a white to, to imbue it with. Although that light blue would do it right here. Oh, that's kind of nice. Let's just push that a little bit so you can see it better. How's that? Um, I'll post them all on Google Classroom so that you can see them. Um, if anybody is having so much trouble with Google Classroom, they have given up, and they, but they are disappointed they can't participate in the um, class lecture notes, uh, send me a private email. I'll send you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation from today. Um, you will have to have a Google account to sign into the Google Classroom. I'm sorry for it. That's just the way it works. Any other questions? We're getting close to the line. Fanny, if you want to just open the line up for um, people to speak up, they're welcome to do that. Oh, and you know what we should do is I wanted to tell you a little bit about June classes, because things are going to change up a little bit for June. I wrote up a couple notes. Um, I just wanted to leave the chat line open just for a minute more on this topic. Anybody have more questions or comments to make? about roses and apples and atmospheric perspective. Oh, the blue does help, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So in June and July, classes, I wrote up just a little page so you can read it. Um, classes will extend a few more minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. The 50 minutes of this kind of lecture where I sort of focus on a topic, I try to keep the topics independent from one another so that if you miss class, uh, you can just pick up where you left off. Um, or you can look at the notes and the Google Classroom and catch up that way. Um, I'm hoping to improve my technology kit. Um, things are looking good for that, um, including the problem where if I put my hand here, it focuses on my knuckle and then the page is not in focus. I almost solved that and I hoped to be live today, but I also think next time it will be live. I think it will be live tomorrow. Um, and then we'll, so we'll have 50 minutes of lecture, 25 minutes of discussion, and the discussion will include feedback. I will ask people to be brave and submit um, uh, pictures and artworks to discuss as a group. It is enormously difficult let me just demonstrate to this. When somebody holds up a picture to their webcam, like this, and says, what do you think? Uh, it's enormously difficult for us to look at that. So um, that is difficult. Uh, so what I would like people to do is submit things in advance. I think the first lesson, due June, June 1st, I will post it when you sign up, and so that we'll have something to start off with. I'll also be happy to do sort of uh, impromptu drawing lessons. If somebody says, I want to learn to draw this, we'll just fiddle around with that and see what we can do. And um, you may yeah. want to add, or, or I can add, hi, this is Fanny. Um, the classes that Anne will be teaching in June and July will be interactive. So everyone will have audio and video. It won't be a webinar like this. Yeah. So, so the. Uh, yeah, the format will change. It'll, it'll be 20 people, so we'll just have the line open during the lecture, and then during the 25 minutes of discussion, it'll just be give and take, very informal sort of chatty system. Um, so it'll feel less alone, and I feel alone talking to my camera, and I'm sure you also feel that way as well. So it'll be more inclusive and much sort of friendlier. Um, let's see if there was anything else on that note that I didn't touch on. Anything else you want to add to that? 
Uh, um, and says, how about a painting class? Okay, um, I'll get to that in just a sec. So the June curriculum, June 1st, week one, we're gonna combine sketches and photography sources and kind of talk a little bit about conceptual thinking and how to use conceptual thinking to make your drawings even better. Um, second week, we'll be talking about composition and design and designing a sketchbook page um, and using our composing abilities to make it look snazzy. Uh, week three, we'll be doing some rough drafting because this is when you actually think about laying things down and making them sort of solid. And then week four, we'll be, I'll be talking about various ways to transfer and complete a drawing. And then I'll also talk about how you send out drawings to people. Um, I, we may actually start off with a little bit of planning because I have had very good luck submitting drawings and illustrations to local newspapers, and I know they're dying for content. So if you want to go through this whole process, the process is actually designed for you to create something to send out to somebody. You may want to think a little bit ahead of time about what you would send out. So we may discuss that either on the Google Classroom or during class time, although this is a pretty ambitious subject list, so it may be something we discuss on Google Classroom. Um, so that's the June curriculum. I didn't write out the July curriculum, but I have it up there in my head. The July curriculum is called Deep Dive into Watercolor, and it will be more color mixing exercises. Um, also just upping your skills in watercolor and how to handle the medium and working processes. Like how do you start and how do you finish a painting? A lot of people work in watercolor in what they call three passes, where they do a pass over the painting and then they do another pass and then they do a third pass. And I don't know if you saw this all in process, but that's kind of what I did here for this little picture. Um, uh, and that actually results in a fairly rich result. And the difficulty with watercolor is that you want a rich result and not a muddy result. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, so July will really be not so much like June, which is let's make something that's sort of final. It'll be more like, let's play with watercolor and see what we can learn from it. Um, I can post in our current Google Classroom some of the projects I have planned for July and June as well. Um, Please view class materials on my Google Classroom. The login code is Alpha Quebec for Mike Bravo Romeo Sierra. Thank you for joining Anne's Art Desk. These videos are brought to you by the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation.